Good afternoon, folks. I'm taking off my scarf because I actually don't need to whoa, wear it. I'm coming at you for a new vlog. I'm having such a crap week. Like a week where I'm thinking like, why am I on the internet? I hate the internet <laughs> and yeah, it's been a rough one, guys. But I thought I wouldn't let people get me down and instead I would start a new vlog and then because I have lots of things to talk about this week. I am just making, or I didn't even make, Tom just delivered me a lovely looking tart and hummus for lunch. I just came back from tutoring. I have to show you this wonderful drawing. This is me and the little boy tutor, but we're holding hands and there's a love heart, so I'm not sure what's going on here. Do I need to question him? I don't know, but anyway, and I also got a wonderful Christmas card from Kieran, which was so nice, and now I need to be a better person and go and buy my Christmas card this weekend. As you can see, there aren't even any decorations up in my flat. I'm such a Grinch, don't really like Christmas, but I think this year I will buy a little Christmas tree at least. I used to, my old flat had a garden, I used to just like decorate on the bushes outside, but my the flat I live in now doesn't have that, so I feel like I should make an effort and maybe lift my spirits. It's Friday, I have such a nice weekend planned of doing not a lot, but I'm gonna go sea swimming and then Tom and I booked to go to like one of our favourite pubs that was reopened for a very safe COVID lunch, um, which will be nice. And then we're going to go into town and support some of our local independent shops to pick up some of our last Christmas presents for friends and family, because obviously a lot of them are going off in the post. So we need to get ahead with that. So I'll show you a browse around the lanes, which is like a beautiful part of Brighton. But yeah, I thought I'd tell you what I'm reading. I'm listening to an audio, The Secret Social Lives of Extremists. I or is it just the social lives of extremists? I'll put, you know, you'll see the picture here on audio. And I'm loving it. It's really playing into things I've been reading recently. Like it's linking up to a lot of the ideas of from We Need New Stories by Nezrin Malik. This idea, that book for me really provided a framework to then, that I could use to absorb all of the cultural content that I consume. And like, it it just really allowed me to develop this critical lens of when I read something or I watch something or I read something to think, who is writing this? Who is benefiting from the writing of this? And most importantly, who is losing out from the writing of this? And especially with this click activism we're seeing online and um, people jumping to conclusions a lot of the time, it really, that book has really helped me frame things in a sense of the widest picture possible and understanding okay, you're, you're doing that and saying those things because you believe in X, Y, and Z because of the way you've consumed media. And I don't know, it like helped me be more pragmatic and less emotional when I think about um, social justice issues, which I feel like is helpful. So anyway, that's a different book that I've already raved about loads, but that has linked up to a lot of ideas in The Secret Lives of Extremists about how people move and start to perpetuate myths online and they believe in things like eugenics and, you know like far right nationalist parties believing in like Aryan race and all that sort of stuff um and sort of how these communities are bred online and which links up to a book I read earlier in the year um the the men who hate women which obviously was all about the online misogyny and the manosphere that comes into this as well and it talks about a lot of platforms that I don't know that much about like I'm finding the chapter I'm reading quite now right now is really interesting on discord which i know a lot of my friends use and i know one of my favorite creators lena norms she um her gumption club like run a book club on there and i think there obviously are a lot of people talking about really cool stuff on there but i'm just so afraid of platforms that i don't know and i know there's a dark side to instagram i've been involved in many turf arguments and seen a lot of those really scary pages but for some reason discord and these sort of like chat apps are like really really crazy to me and i'm sort of t terrified of them um so that's really interesting so far and they've spoken about like how they recruit people and how people are sort of led down a path which i think they talked to um, laura bates talked about in the men who hate women this idea that you the algorithm is against you that you go into something thinking you're looking for just some relationship advice and then you end up reading about these things and you become indoctrinated and it's sort of like a process but yeah, I'm really, really enjoying that um, on audio. And then I haven't, I'm not reading anything right now. I've picked up like three books and none of them have taken my fancy. But when I go to my second shift at work tonight, I've got Memorial by Brian Washington, 
in my bag. I just want something really comforting. I mean, the last time I tried to eat something comforting and I ended up with racist Kevin Kwan. But I feel like this will be comforting. It talks a lot about food, which I find really comforting to read about. And I think it's a lot about like a familial relationship where not a lot happens. And I feel like that's maybe what I want right now. Like I just want to read about someone else's life that has no bearing on my own. That I can't constantly draw connections to and feel better or worse about myself from. So that's what I'm going to do. But I also wanted to pop in, this is going to be such a long clip, and talk about um, reading middle grade. I had a really interesting conversation with my friends on Bookstagram about um, middle grade books and sort of like why adults read middle grade. And I could so easily hide behind the guise of saying I read middle grade because I'm a teacher, because I'm involved with children. And that is partly true. I started re like I was reintroduced to middle grade. If you don't know even what middle grade is, one of my friends didn't hadn't heard the term, it is basically just children's books, like chapter children's books. Harry Potter was originally middle grade. His art materials is middle grade, like those sorts of things. It's children's books, it doesn't have to be fantasy, but children's books basically that aren't picture books. I also love picture books. <laughs> um, but I was reintroduced to reading middle grade when I was starting to be a teacher because I obviously read books with my class. I was um, exposed to a lot of books and then I wanted to do my own research and ensure that the, the book recommendations I was giving to children and parents were as diverse and representative as possible. So then I read a lot more of like British writers or writers from different backgrounds reading children's stories that I could recommend to people because I hate to recommend something, especially to children that I wasn't 100% sure of the content of. So that's how I got back into reading middle grade. But I can now say even if I don't become a teacher, I will continue to read it. And I don't know if that's weird. Like, I don't, I mean, I don't think it's weird because at the end of the day, it's like you, it's like simple psychology you're just returning to something you find comforting because you are nostalgic for your, your innocent childhood like I feel like it makes a lot of sense and I definitely lean on middle grade when I'm feeling anxious when my mental health is in a poor place or when I'm stressed like I, it's easy to absorb obviously because it's written for children but it like provides the ultimate escape I guess and I can but I find it more I have no interest in reading adult fantasy because I don't read it I wouldn't find that escapist because I would be trying to understand the allegory and why people are doing things and they have very complex magic systems and political systems and they obviously draw on reality and I don't have any interest in participating in that because I read middle grade fantasy for pure joy like that's it um but yeah, I would love to hear in the comments because I got a couple of comments recently when I recommended Nevermore from people saying, oh, I'm going to start reading it. And I would love to read, hear about why you chose to read it or why you love it because um, I like it as well. Um, but I've just started a new, I listen to it also, interestingly, all my middle grade on audio. Like I consume it always as if I'm just sort of watching a kid's movie, which I also still do watch those too. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I'm list I just started a new series called The Wizards of Once by Cressida Cowell, who was like our children's laureate in the UK. So like she's like a big children's writer. And the audiobook is by David Tennant, who was Doctor Who for a long time and has a great accent. So yeah, I started that last night and it's nice. It's got four or five in the series. So I was like, that'll give me some good willpower because I just finished the third um if the nevermore series which is like up to date with what came out and that only came out like two months ago so i've got like a year wait which is depressing but yeah that's what i'm reading i'll update you show you some clips of my weekend and hope it'll bring you some solace and some joy in these continuingly tricky times hi guys i'm all wrapped up because i don't know why this is showing in red is this an update my like time is showing in red Anyway, I just got some proof mail and I thought I would show you. So this is so sick. This is from a new indie press called New Ruins and they are a collab with two of my other favorite indie presses, Dead Ink Books and Influx Press. Um, I love all of what those guys put out. Um, and this is their new venture called New Ruins where they're aiming to, it says, a collaborative project Paperback original imprint focusing on porous and uncanny boundary between the edgelands of literary fiction and genres. I think that sounds really cool. Um, so they sent me their first ever release and it is called Absorbed by Kylie Whitehead. Kylie Whitehead is a Welsh author, which is really cool. So shout out to uh, Kieran on that one. And this is being compared to Moshvik, Lara Williams and Halle Butler. You guys know I love all of those books. But I love Washbeck and Butler, and I did really enjoy 
Supper Club by Lara Williams. So, um, also compared to Sophie McIntosh, which I've never read, she wrote The Water Cure and her new one, The Blue Ticket. The Blue Ticket sounds more interesting to me. Let me know if you've read any um, Sophie McIntosh, because I would be interested. But um, Absorbed by Kylie Whitehead is about Alison and Owen. They've been together since university. She works the dull office job and her only personality is now she is Owen's girlfriend. So she decides to become part of him as he is slipping away from her. So it says it deals with body horror, um, female insecurity and modern relationships. So I guess it's going to be quite a physical manifestation of her absorbing him or like taking parts of him the body horror thing is scaring me but I'm getting more into reading it when it's like backed up with a lot of like different discussion and symbolism I do find it interesting so it says he takes she starts to take Owen's best qualities and becoming the person she thought she would be but is Owen all she needs to compete herself or can she never be a whole person I think that's so interesting and I'm hoping there's a lot of introspection on relationships and what it means to be in a partnership and if you lose part of yourself and part of your identity when you sort of morph into these this one entity that people treat you as a couple so I'm really excited to read that it comes out in May next year and I'm sure you will see it featured on my channel so thank you New Ruins um, and Influx Press and Edding for that one I'm off to work now uh, hence why I'm all wrapped up ready to go and stand in the school playground and pick up children so um, I will speak to you guys at the weekend or tonight good morning everyone I look very tired um, what was I gonna say? Tom's gone to get croissants for breakfast and then we're actually going to the sauna on the beach which I'm so excited about and can't wait to lie down and uh, get hot and sweaty and then go swimming in the sea. So that's gonna be so nice and then it's all very obviously COVID safe. Um, and then we're going to get a Christmas tree later and we might pop to the bookshop because I want to get a couple of presents for some friends to put in the post. Um, so I'll show you that. I started Memorial last night and I really like it. I'm only like 20 pages in. I got distracted as always chatting to people instead of reading um, late into the night. But, oh, excuse me. Um, yeah, I really like it. It's in a really like funny it's like funny and it's written in a very colloquial sense of um in terms of language it's got an interesting structure there's no speech marks but it is laid out in with dialogue the dialogue does feel quite realistic um it jumps around a lot in narrative like you move from them first dating to their experience right now and i guess then when um i should actually tell you what the premise is it's about two uh young men Benson and Mike who are like fairly recently into their relationship I think like three or four years but they live together um Mike's had a turbulent upbringing and Benson's family his dad lives abroad and they don't speak to each other but he's dying so he's gone to see him while unfortunately at the same time his mother-in-law arrives in America to spend time with them so his boyfriend and his mother-in-law are left in this one bedroom flat to get acquainted with each other we're not sure if she really approves of the relationship if she really understands his sexuality um but yeah it's really interesting so far and it's like had a couple of laugh out loud moments but yeah i'm not sure i i didn't actually even really synthesize people's criticisms of it because i just didn't want to be like my glasses to be shaded by it so i can't remember what people said about it that they didn't like but i'm having a nice time um so yeah i'm gonna snuggle down the sofa and read that later before i go back to work tonight um to babysit so yeah um i'll show you some clips probably non-talking clips of us swimming and getting our christmas tree and then i'll speak to you later <laughs> you manhandled the cross on oh you're gonna think it's horrible Nigella Lawson. Um, Christmas tree shopping. Stations of landscape. And of course.
hey guys i'm off into town to do some christmas shopping and um go out for a little celebratory lunch with my boyfriend which would be nice but i thought i would come in to tell you what i'm gonna read this morning while i'm hanging out i have a copy of i hate men i was sent by fourth estate books i'm so excited to get to they also sent me this sick t-shirt which i showed you in my last video but i'm actually really cold so i'm wearing a sweater today but i'm gonna sit here and dive into this essay collection written by a French feminist called Pauline Harm Monge? Monge? Um, all about why she hates men. No, it's about um, her sexuality and her being a feminist and that interaction with the male gaze. So it's really short, but I hope it'll be fabulous. And um, please enjoy a reading montage of me enjoying it. Hi folks, we're back with some more Tom content, since that's what the followers want. No, um, I was just sitting here reading I Hate Men, and Tom had just finished one of my favourite books of 2019 or 2018, which is Saltwater, Saltwater by Jessica Andrews, which won the Portico Prize. Um, it's a northern, it's a northern tale, a northern book, which is cool. And I thought it would be cool for him to share his thoughts. You can listen to us converse because I um, haven't spoken about this book on my channel because I read it before this sphere of the internet existed. Tell us what you thought about Saltwater. What's your rating? You're a ratings man. Yeah. Um, out of ten? Yeah. Uh, if or you want, five? Whatever you like. I think out of five is easier. I would probably yeah. give it a, like four and a half. <gasps> okay, okay. Um, yeah, I just, I really enjoyed it. Did you like the narrative style? It's quite um, particular, I would say. Ew. Like, you take some getting used to. Mm, but I think you get, you just get into it quite easily because it is in those very small chunks. Yeah. Um, and you're always kind of wanting more and you're trying to thread this kind of narrative through the mm. different blocks. So it's a coming-of-age story set in initially Sunderland, right? And then... Our protagonist moves to London and then her... Is it her granddad that passes away? Yeah. Her granddad passes away on her paternal side, right? And then she goes back... No, maternal, maternal side. side. And she goes back to Ireland and, like, learns about his history and, like, sort of, like, small country life. So there's a real juxtaposition between, like, her very busy university experience in London and then, like, going to somewhere quite remote, which I really liked. Yeah, I enjoyed the the kind of intersection of talking about class yeah in it like obviously Sunderland is a very working class area and she is from a very working class background and you especially see that with because it kind of calls back to her grandparents mm -hmm. and her parents and you see how they grew up and uh, yeah she's very much from a working class background and just how that is juxtaposed when she goes to London to do like I can't remember what I did, like, literature, something, creative yeah, writing, quite middle something class. that all of the uh, the rich kids do. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just her kind of finding her place mm. within London and trying to negotiate that identity, like, even in terms of, like, I mean, she speaks about it in, like, her first lecture where she's just very conscious of how she speaks. Sounds, yeah. I love, I love a... A meta level to a narrative and I feel like that it, it does play it talks about language a lot like how um exciting times when Nisha Dolling talk, talked about language in teaching English like I really like that aspect of like I love books about words and I, I love how she spoke about that especially intersecting with like you say her class identity and I don't read enough I read so much non-fiction about class in the UK but rarely fiction I feel like it comes up less in like a real like actually well developed narrative that isn't stereotypical or yeah. leaning into like some really bad tropes, you know what I mean? Yeah, like the classic neoliberal rags to riches. Yeah, exactly. But I really liked that that she sort of then went to Ireland and that's a whole different system of class and discovery and like finding your place there as an outsider as well. So very much a story of outsiders. Yeah, definitely. But you you rate it, you recommend. Yeah, definitely. 
Well, I heartily approve this book. <laughs> there you go, kiss. Another love of salt water. I know my friend Grace loves salt water too, I believe. Um, we're now off to our local city centre to brave the shopping crowds. I don't... Jo sorry, I was just reading the, um, the back of it and it says, like the independent said, a distinctive new voice for fans of Fleabag or Sally Rooney and you're just really kind of shooting fish in a barrel with yeah, that one, right? Yeah, fucking hate that. <laughs> oh, it's so annoying. Like, why? There's actually a really good article I'll post down below that I someone else posted on Bookstagram about this idea specifically when we're talking about a millennial women writing books that they have to be, for some reason, more than an author. Like, they have to be the voice of the generation or they have to be the Part new of Sally this Rooney. Yeah, cultural Yeah, like the trend. new canon. It's like, why can't they just write a fucking good book and we move on? Yeah, and definitely. it's it's so particular when we think about like new female voices, like they are because of the history behind like the misogyny of literature and the canon, alongside obviously the racism and the classism. It's like they have to carry that history on their shoulders and be this new generation of like trailblazers. When it's like, can't they just write books? <laughs> well, and just this idea of like, like especially with like, flea, what's the connection flea, with Fleabag? With Fleabag and that, that I don't know that you're writing about this kind of prototypical millennial female experience yeah. like that is all encompassing but that's completely different like yeah that touches on ireland and so does sally rooney but they're completely like the the, the characters ages the protagonist what's being explored is like really quite different yeah it's just very lazy um blurbing and it just yeah. it sets up the writers to fail yeah because then you're you're judging them by this really arbitrary yardstick that they're not yeah. Even like cognizant of. Exactly. And also, you're putting off people who didn't like Sally Rooney to read this. And then you're also saying to people who are fans of Sally Rooney are going to turn their nose up at this because it's not Sally Rooney. Yeah. I just don't think that comparison thing works very well at all. It's like when someone called Queenie the new Bridget Jones, I was like, have you read either of these books? Like, except the fact they're about women, there's nothing I could draw comparisons to. I think that's, that's more the case with any, like, reviewing any kind of cultural thing, though, right? Is, the easiest way to kind of to measure anything is to compare it to, to things that before. you already know. Yeah, yeah, and I do understand that, but I think yeah, I don't know. It's just a very reductive way because you're not taking it as a piece of art on its, on its own, own terms. only in relation to something else. Yeah. Does it then become important? Which is ridiculous. Yeah. Anyway, sorry for you witnessing that ramble. If you do find it interesting, post your comments below. Do you hate when they say the new Sally Rooney or the new? Hey guys, it's been another rough day, but I'm here to show you some exciting posts. I did try and film in the car earlier when I was going to the supermarket, but it was so bumpy, I'm going to save you from that. But my copy of Luster arrived from the lovely... CJ, who then sent it to Kieran, who sent it to Grace, who then sent it to me, and I will read it. It's really thrown a spanner in my reading works, because I want to read this right now and put out everything else I'm reading. But I always have reading responsibilities and reviews to post, so yeah, I would definitely think I will like dive into this. My weekend plans just got cancelled because um, London just like went into tier three, so I was going to safely see some friends outdoors, but we're not even going to do that now, so... I think I will cozy up with this book, which will be delightful. And I didn't get to catch up with you yesterday on I Hate Men. I read the whole thing in like an hour or two. As you can see, I pinned down a lot of the pages. Obviously the title is extremely inflammatory. Um, Pauline Harmage, Harmage is not suggesting that we kill men and start living in a society without them. That's obviously also not possible. Um, she is making some really radical points, some of which I think would take me a while to come around to, but um, she's talking basically about the idea of misandry and this, um, just the view we have of um, consistently having lower standards for the behaviour we accept from men versus women. And I was actually having an interesting conversation with my boyfriend, who I consider, like Pauline Harmage talks about like she is a bisexual woman married to a man in a heterosexual relationship so she like presents or like she passes as um, heterosexual in her everyday life sort of thing and I think that's an interesting intersection to discuss um, and she was talking about like oh I'm married to a great guy and like 
he's very like forward thinking and stuff like that but even then I find myself in these situations where I'm constantly assuming what people would think he has done is really amazing when really the bar is just so fucking low which I can I can definitely relate to um I also one of the things that stuck me so much was she makes this point about how current feminism which I see this so much online and I'm definitely guilty of of perpetuating as well saying like stop raising boys like stop making your boyfriends or treating the men in your life as if you're their mothers like stop raising him he's not your son that whole shtick which I think has some value as well about man children but she makes this really interesting point where it's it's interesting that we use that as a piece of modern day deterrent against man children when at the end of the day that is sort of like um, against the mothers that did raise them and saying they weren't raised well enough by women to be proper people and I just thought that was really interesting and I hadn't really put that together before that yet again we are laying the blame of responsibility at the feet of women the women who came before us to raise the sons that we are now involved in but I thought that was really interesting um, but yeah I will wrap this up fully in a video but it was definitely food for thought and one I would think would make an excellent stocking filler for any uh, feminists in your life so that's the update there as far as um sorry this lighting's so bad isn't it as far as memorial goes i am really enjoying it it's quite disjointed the way the um dialogue is written doesn't have any speech marks which i do remember from lot and it's quite um yeah it's quite disjointed in terms of it flits between narratives of times when the couple were together and like uh, moments of memory that benson has and then um now when he's alone with the mother-in-law and their experiences going on at the moment it is really interesting there's a storyline of alcoholism and sort of like estranged parenting and um queer relationships and navigating non um monogamous queer relationships which i think is really interesting but yeah, I haven't quite settled my thoughts on it yet, but I will update you when I have. But I am enjoying it so far. I'm like 130 pages in and I probably will finish it in the next couple of days and you will see my final opinion. So yeah, I'm off to get into bed now. I've just written loads of Christmas cards and uh, that's all my energy's at for the day. So I'll speak to you guys soon. Bye! My vlog is getting excessively long, but there's nothing I want to cut out. So I'm so sorry if people don't want to listen to 35 minutes. But I'm here to update you because I'm halfway through Memorial. I probably actually won't update again until I finish it. And then I'll finish this vlog, I swear. I'm really loving it. I'm, and we've just moved to section two, which is now from Mike's perspective. So Mike is the Japanese-American um man in the relationship and he has gone back to japan to spend time with his father who has terminal cancer who was very estranged and just like a shit person growing up um and i'm loving loving the scenes in japan he's helping out his dad run this bar there's loads of interesting characters that come into the bar that we learn about their backstory from while also seeing their relationship develop um and it's really really interesting and i really love that narrative and i haven't seen anyone compliment that really interesting juxtaposition between the relationship he has with his mother who is back in America at present with his boyfriend and the relationship he has with his dad and then how that's reversed in Benson's relationship with his mother being um like quite well developed and then the relationship he has Benson has with his father is also being fraught and it's sort of like these two men haven't come together and discussed their similarities with their parenting and they see themselves as quite different because of their own identities as a queer black man and a queer Japanese American man and I think that's really interesting so yeah not really understanding the criticism so far really having a nice time um but I will keep reading and I'll let you know I'm addicted to spending money I don't have on overpriced coffee and donuts to make myself feel better so cheers Good morning, folks. I've just got out of bed. Um, and I thought I would... Oh, my God, it's so sunny. I don't know if I'm offended by that. I would tell you that I finished Memorial. And I loved it. I had a really good time. I spoke to my friend CJ about it last night because she gave it two stars. <gasps> Savage. Um, 
And it was interesting, she said that she didn't feel like the characters were that different in their, um, like, the Japanese versus the black American characters, but I don't know, I felt like they quite had, they had quite strong voices. A lot of people, I think, are jarred by the dialogue setup, which I will show you, because I feel like that, if that annoys you, it would annoy you throughout this. So can you see here, it's like, no speech marks, and it's like, written very colloquially, like, Sorry, he says, it's fine, I say. Um, and it occasionally has, which my friend Jay said he didn't like, quite random breaking. I'm trying to find you an example. This isn't a very good example, but like basically the page breaks quite randomly. But I don't know, I was really in the swing of reading it. I don't have a problem with no um, speech marks because I read a lot of books like that. So I feel like I just got on board when it was a thing and now I'm fine with it. Um, but I know it jars a lot of people. My favourite parts were the chapter in Osaka in Japan. And I loved that look at um, life in Japan and the experiences of growing older there and their different customs. And I thought the exploration of I like it, identity politics between our two main protagonists, a black American and um, a Japanese American, and them sort of like trying to come together over their marginalization and view their oppression as similar. But the, but um, Benson, who's the black American guy, was seemingly frustrated with the amalgamation of their experiences, which I can obviously see there's different dynamic going on there. And I thought that was a really interesting and the tension that it displayed within the identity politics I really liked. So yeah, I really liked this, going against the grain. Then I also finished, um, which I haven't spoken about much in this vlog because I've been listening to it like in long chunks, and that is Going Dark, The Secret Life of, The Secret Social Lives of Extremists. This is a picture of it because I Get, keeping the title wrong but I love love loved this book highly recommend it on audio highly recommend a listen if you're interested in discussions about again online culture the uh, manifestation of extremism in online spaces the way that social media like conglomerates aren't doing enough to combat these issues like Facebook Twitter and then what I learned so much about was these other platforms that are used like telegram and these other encrypted apps that are used to plan like DIY terrorism which was crazy I learned about Nazi rock festivals and dating as a white nationalist it was like super interesting super informative and I loved that it really delved deep into right-wing nationalism because as she mentioned in the book we see so much in the media in the UK at least about um like Islamic fundamental terrorism and the threat that that has on our country and she gives some great statistics to, su to suggest that it's disproportionately we're being marketed disproportionately at that type of terrorism when white terrorism and white nationalism and national fronts are um increasingly a bigger threat to our communities and i loved how well referenced it was how academically centered her arguments were and at the back the last chapter she speaks to 10 different experts of 10 different countries and asks them what they think the next threat in our world is which obviously is extremely scary but I really appreciated just like the breadth of her like the, her knowledge and who she decided to ask in those senses because there was some really interesting answers people talking about if environmental terrorism or environmental extremism will um have an upsurgence which i think is really interesting and also the threat of um the way online spaces will continue to co-opt young people into performing acts of terrorism and radicalizing them into the right which yeah loved it so much highly recommend and now I'm going to start Luster, which I don't think I'm going to put in this vlog. I'm going to say bye for now and I will start a new vlog probably over the weekend. And I'll see you guys then. Thanks for watching. Bye.